Hello and welcome to Conversations here on NCA Network. Conversations is a program where we talk about everything under the sun, issues that affect you and me. My name is Nikkei. We have a full house today and I'm just going to let everyone introduce themselves before we get to the topic. Doris Izua, Dr. Doris Izua, Clinical Director of LG Health Foundation okay. and Autism Center. Great. Uh, my name is Sylvia Tagbo KK. I'm a mom. Okay. I'm Dr. Badewa Adejube Williams. I'm an educational therapist. I have a learning center for persons of various ages with various developmental disorders. I'm Kusia Sobokuro. I'm a psychologist and a behavior analyst. I work with children with special needs okay. and mental health challenges. Okay, well, uh, now you've heard the names of our guests and what it is that they do, you can kind of deduce what we're talking about today. We're talking about special needs education, special needs in general in Nigeria. We'll take a quick break and I'll be right back after this. When there's a child out there that's not getting the same that your own child is getting, the difference will tell and there will come a time in the society where that child is going to take his pound of flesh. Where you can actually, everything from watching a, a program with the child, you can start up the conversation from something on the TV and yeah. say, oh, you know. <laughs> for, me, for me, it's like hurry up with this business. Mm. And the other one said, I see it's not about me, it's about the guys, it's they're not ready the to marry. Yes. If she wants to ask something, no, I know my mother very well. <laughs> In fact, the most interesting one is when I put up pictures on WhatsApp, you know, Snapchat filters and all that, she will call me, mm -hmm. remove that picture. <laughs> <laughs> I, there was a day, I got tired of all that. at all, I just get on with it. A man that would dare to ask the wife, who do you think you are? That is a real man. In fact, our husbands are our firstborns. The husband needs more attention than even the children. It's not only about work, it's not only about family. They need to take the time to look after themselves. And we don't, we don't do that. They took my money. I paid every fees. I never asked to be hoisted as a governor. I wanted to be allowed to go out there and contest for the position of uh, uh, governorship candidate first. There's nothing greater than looking back and seeing that while you were aspiring, you were able to inspire others. Empower to women. Yes, we need to have more women, more multitaskers around Nigeria to get Nigeria working. Definitely. Welcome back to the Conversation Room. Today, we're talking about special needs and special needs education here in Nigeria. It's a full house. Everyone has introduced themselves, but I'm going to start with Dr. Badewa. Uh, you talked about having a center for people that need special education in one form or another. Could you throw some light on that? Yes, I will. Educational therapy is about retraining the brain so that the brain will function at its optimal level. Basically what that is, if a child or an adult has any form of disability, first the child or the adult has to be diagnosed okay. with whatever the neurodevelopmental disability is. And then we further diagnose where the cognitive levels are. Because it isn't everyone with a disability who has a cognitive dysfunction. Okay. So if there's a significant intellectual cognitive disability, then we now develop a treatment plan for that child. What is it that the child is strong at? And what are the areas of needs for the child? We now look at those and see how we can compensate and develop treatment plans to address the specific areas of challenges. Okay. Okay. Now, if a child comes to us with a disability and the child doesn't have a significant discrepancy, then we refer the child for inclusion because we believe in inclusive education. Okay, but uh, when you say uh, developmental disability, when, when do you know that your child might need a bit of help, your child 
might need to have an assessment done. I, I know you're a mom, Sylvia, and a doctor you've worked with, um, you, you, you're in the, in the field already. At which point do you know, when do you start to get help for the child, when you realize the child isn't meeting up to the pairs in class? Okay. So, yeah. okay. For me, uh, as a mom, um, the first trigger is the speech. Okay. When the child is not talking the way the child is supposed to talk. And there are other certain milestones that you look out for that the child is not meeting. Maybe they don't look you in the eye, okay. they're socially, they're not as social as their peers. Then I said, you, you, you just know, we have this motherly instinct mm. that we just tell you, no, something is not right okay. here. And that's when the first thing I tell parents, go for evaluation. You have nothing to lose. You either, you either get a positive result or a negative result. And okay. if it's negative, early intervention is key. Okay. You start addressing it immediately. Okay. Doctor, you want to add to that? Yes. Um, every child for, for age has their own milestones, which is expected of them for age, like for two-year-olds, 18 months, there are things they're supposed to meet. We call them milestones. Now, when we have a delay in the milestones, for example, a child at six months is supposed to recognize the mother, supposed to cool and bubble and say all those things. When a child is indifferent, not doing all that, for the age of that child, we call it surveillance and we tell the mother, oh, your child might need further assessment. So we look at the speech and communication, we look at the social interaction, that's the looking at the person in the eyes and recognizing the mother. Look at the motor skills as well, we look at the cognitive function. So when a child is not meeting up with the milestones for a longer period of time, it calls for assessment. Okay, you talked about motor skills and um, cognitive. Cognitive skills, Could you tell communication. Us what that is really in day-to-day -day okay. living because there are people watching and they're not quite sure what that is. For example, the motor skills, we have the fine motor skill and we have the gross motor skill. Okay. For example, the gross motor skill is what's using our whole muscles. At six months, a child should be sitting down unsupported on his or her own. At one year, a child is expected to start making steps and walking. By 15 months, a child should be walking. Now, for those milestones, if the child is not able to meet them, then there should be an assessment for that child. For fine motor skills, the ability to use the fine fingers, the fine muscles of the hand, picking things, grabbing things, using the, 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 the tool, the thumb, the pincer grab. Okay. When a child is, maybe before one year, the child is using only one hand or not being able to rise, scribble, or even reach out for toys, that child might have significant delays and should be assessed. For communication, the speech, at three months, the child should be cooing. By six months, should be babbling and making some vowel sounds. Mm -hmm. At one year, the child should have some words. At two years, could actually have two to three words in a sentence, being able to say some things. At three years, the child should know the age, the sex, even, um, the name, be able to say the name, use some prepositions, okay. start making sentences enough for you to understand. So when there is significant delays in those things, it calls for an in-depth assessment. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Ka Kosi. Kosi. Um, I, I'm guessing that assessment is something that you do often. Yeah. Um, for people who are watching you and wondering, okay, um, I've kind of almost, just like Sylvia said, mother's intuition, something tells me something might not quite be right. What does an assessment in, uh, involve really? What are you going to do if I leave my child with you for an assessment? Um, okay, usually we have skills we use to assess the child. Okay. Apart from the skills, we first do an informal assessment. That's what we do. So we observe the child in his natural environment, try to see, okay, what's this child able to do? We do an interview with the parents. So far, what are the challenges you've observed? Mm -hmm. What do you think? What are the deficits? And sometimes we also have late bloomers. So we're also being careful to be sure that that child is not a late bloomer, okay. so that the parents are not worried for nothing. He might just be a late bloomer. Then against those skills, we tick off, like she mentioned, developmental milestones. We tick off, is this child at two years, like she mentioned, the child should be walking. Is he walking? Mm -hmm. We tick off based on those skills and we check, okay, is he able to do this? We create scenarios, experiments, create scenarios for the child okay. to be able to do those activities and we test, okay, can you do this at this point? Can you do this at this point? 
Um, but usually at childhood, we do it more of what we call play therapy. We create a play environment so that they are able to reach for those things or to participate in those activities. Then we can assess and say, okay, um, there's a delay in this area. Like she said, in speech, there are skills we used to know. Vowel sounds, is child queen, is he babbling, those kind of things. We also check, okay, jaw movement. Is he able to chew? Is he able to swallow? You know, those are some of the sounds. What are the kind of sounds he's making? Okay. Is it a phonetic disorder? Those are things we check. Like yeah. the fine motor, is it a muscle tone issue? Okay. Is it hypo or hyper? You know, you need to check all those things. You also check behavioral challenges. Is there abuse in the home? Okay. Sometimes you have those delays because of abuse okay. and some other issues. So these are the things we check basically yeah. in assessment. Uh, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming when you send a child for an assessment is because... Uh, the child f looks physically okay mm -hmm. and then you're not quite so for children that you can actually see that there is a challenge for instance down syndrome mm -hmm. cerebral palsy do they still need to have an assessment done oh yes mm -hmm. they do maybe Dr. Definitely might want they to do. add to that absolutely every child must have an assessment done because okay. it, a lot of times we just assume you know because of a physical yes you know that we see however you do assessment to check the baseline and then the functionality, the adaptive skills, the intellectual level, the cognitive level, really. Is this child able to respond? Does this child comprehend? Is this child able to reason? Can this child organize and plan? What about the memory? Mm -hmm. What about the executive functioning skills? What about the academic readiness skills? So you have to have that discrepancy with those. And as she had indicated, initial assessment really should be done by clinical psychologists, or a developmental specialist, or neurologist at times. For the other aspects of it, for the learning, if there's a learning disability, an educational therapist can assess that. And there are standardized assessments that are scientific, okay. that are used for this. And there has to be a marked discrepancy based on the percentage level. If the child is functioning below 70% intellectually, mm -hmm. then you have to worry. You know, that it could be mild to moderate, it could be moderate to severe. Okay. So that will test is it scientific, it, and it can be tested anywhere in the world. Any child with the same assessment should yield a result. And the result from the psychoeducation could, should correlate with whatever the, with the clinical psychologist has. So, you know, if they correlate, then definitely there's a discrepancy. Mm -hmm. But if they do not, then you have to reassess okay. you know, and, and dig further okay. to see what's wrong. You mentioned um, inclusion at some point um, earlier in the program. And I was wondering, you know, back then, if a child wasn't up to speed with the rest of the class they're just like oh the child is a little bit slow is a little bit slow so is it really a good idea to include um, such children in the class or should they have their own class their own school what's the what's the right thing to do okay the levels okay the first thing point of call of course is inclusion mm -hmm. but it's based on the ability of the child inclusive education has quite a lot of benefits academic benefits and social benefits okay okay now, for the inclusive teacher must be skilled, must be competent, must be effective, and must be efficient, okay? That means they must have training for how to differentiate instructions, how to group the children so that those who are lacking behind will pick up. And those who have skills already will even become stronger because we learn by doing. Mm -hmm. You know, when you group them and you have those with skills able to teach others. You don't tutor children, you don't teach to them, you let them become active learners in the learning process. So inclusive education allows this and allows the skills to develop in this format mm -hmm. because they're all involved, they're all actively engaged. They all, they all become active learners is really what I call it. Mm -hmm. And reciprocal teaching is makes the teacher stronger in that skill. Okay. So when you group them appropriately, then of course the child with a strength will remember what he or she has taught somebody else. Okay. You know, so inclusive education is always the core. However, there's some times when you know that the child really is struggling in that class, no matter what you do. You look at their specific topics that the child is struggling with or okay. subject matters. You may do a pull out, okay, and still let them get the social interaction with their peers for other academics okay. that are not so rigorous. But if still they're struggling, then you have to look at alternate placements. So point of call, the assessment will determine. Okay. Definitely. Okay. Um, Sylvia, you wanted okay. to add something? Yeah. I am for inclusive education, but we have to be very careful 
with inclusive education. Okay. Um, if you have a child that is uh, borderline and you put them in a class with normal children, it has to be a collective effort. The teacher, the parents at home, and if they have outside therapy. Mm -hmm. And if the parents is doing one part and in school they are not doing their part, it could actually cause more damage okay. than mm -hmm. good. So we talk about inclusive education, but we really have to make sure that it's really inclusive. Mm. And for those that are quite severe, I don't subscribe to that. They have to first of all, you have to first of all take care of the underlying the behavioral issues, all other issues before you bring them to mm -hmm. a normal school. Okay. okay. Um, doctor, did you want to add to that as well? Yes, I support what both of them said. For severely affected children, for especially those that have neurodevelopmental disorders or mm -hmm. severe cerebral palsy, it's better to keep them in a center that would help them to get ready for school, mm -hmm. work on their behaviors, work on their speech, work on their mobility, because some of our children can actually have sensory issues, they become very hyperactive, they distract themselves and distract others. others okay. So everybody is not learning in class. So by the time you get that under control, and the child is ready for school, you can go and do inclusive education. Sometimes, maybe once a week, you can test it out. Once a week, you can take the child to regular school and then pull him yeah. out and see how he adapts. Okay. But it's always ready. It's always good to get a child ready yeah. before we take them to uh, regular school. Because one of the things that comes to mind as you speak is that, well, if you put the child in a, a class with other people, what if the child might be ready, but what if the teacher isn't quite skilled so as a yes. mother do you go and ask for the cv of the no, no teacher you get a shadow. You get a shadow. as a mother you might get a shadow that will sit with what's the child. a shadow maybe you want to tell us what that is and a therapist that okay. will sit with the child and break it down to what the child can understand okay if the teacher is teaching the therapist is sitting beside the child and you know taking it to the level Okay. okay. And it's a one on one with the therapist. Okay. That way the child doesn't feel left out in the class and okay. he or she is included. Um, but and how so yeah. and to add to what she said, you might end up educating the teacher yourself. Yeah. 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 So they yeah. understand that happens a lot with the mothers. Yeah. 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 They want to educate the teacher, give them information, materials to read to understand your child better. Okay. Okay, she did make a point that there has to be a collaboration mm -hmm. between parents and school. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is really strong. That is a strong point. When my children were growing up and they were having difficulty, I had to go and sit in class to observe what was going on. Okay. That was how I actually reckoned with it because I was in denial initially. Mm -hmm. But going to the classroom to see they were actually struggling, mm -hmm. that just brought it back into me and I had to, to take steps to help them get better. Okay. You know, yes, inclusion is not for everybody, hmm. but as I said, it's a point of call, but it based on, everything is also based on assessment. Yes, if a child has significant, severe disability, of course you don't want to put that child in an inclusive mm -hmm. setting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and another thing I want to, especially for people that have schools and um, they're taking uh, children on the spectrum, there are some schools that will say we do not have an open house. So they don't allow parents that have specialist ah. students to come in to just sit and watch, watch and say, okay, this is the issue that is happening in school. I need to go home and mm -hmm. also work on it. They say, no, you can't go into yeah. the wow. class. You can't pass the reception. And I'm really appealing to those schools to just have a different rule for parents that have children on the special uh, on the Great spectrum, point. On the spectrum. Great point. and is there is there a cause for any of these disorders is there uh, is it a genetic thing is it environmental how what happens when you know you realize that your child is a special needs child okay okay there's no cost per se, depending okay. on the disorder. Okay, for cerebral palsy is a physiological thing. Okay. So that is a different thing altogether. But um, that has to do with birth defects, birth issues. But when you come to autism um, or Down syndrome, for example, Down syndrome is genetic. Okay. Okay, that has to do with anomaly in the genes. But when you talk of autism now, there's no cost. Nobody knows what precipitated it, or ADHD, nobody knows, or learning disability, 
some sometimes you have um hereditary genetic predisposition to them mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily that oh this is the cause or it's like we say sometimes from the village or mm -hmm. the mother mm -hmm. you know the mother shines like mm -hmm. that you didn't take yes, pre yes. um pre your prenatal you vitamins, pre vitamins. Yes, vitamins yes you didn't do that it's none of that okay mm -hmm. and we also need to be conscious of what our environment as you say environmental factors sometimes mm -hmm. okay yes, if you live in an area with high pollution with high toxins you know in the air lead or mercury in the water you have to be careful because these things are causing genetic mutation anyways in even normal human beings so yes they do cause some kind of um, learning disability in some children but as she persists she rightfully said scientists have been researching for years they cannot pinpoint and say this is specifically what causes birth defects yeah. okay or what causes disabilities or neurodevelopmental disorders but environmental factors are really really important oh, yeah. we need to be careful what we eat okay we eat food that have been processed have so many chemicals and even poisonous items in them definitely that will have effect some way or the other and especially if you are pregnant how we take care of ourselves as people you know being around drug users or you know using drugs we have fatal alcohol syndrome also from people who are pregnant and we're drinking and the children come out and they have some form of developmental disorder. So some of these things may add to it. Yeah. But scientifically, there's no specific cause of it. That mm -hmm. somebody can say this is what caused it specifically. Okay. Mm -hmm. But let me speak from the medical point of view. Sure. In some children, in, in neurodevelopmental disorders, we don't really have a specific cause. We just have predisposition fa predisposing factors like they rightly mentioned, heavy metal toxicities. But when it comes to certain developmental disabilities, for example, the physical ones caused by cerebral palsy, where we have physical disabilities, you can actually say this is the cause especially in pregnant women, mm -hmm. before pregnancy, during pregnancy, after pregnancy. Before pregnancy, if a woman is not taking prenatal vitamins, like folic acid, the child can have a bed defect. Mm -hmm. The one, the brain is abnormally formed. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have a big hole in the brain or a growth at the back, neural tube defects. Then when a mother is taking alcohol or cigarette, not necessarily smoking cigarette, but being in a place where they smoke cigarette, the child can have even ADHD, can have problems. When a mother is not eating, right having nutritional deficiencies it will affect the child mm -hmm. and then during um, doing labor you know our custom oh you have to deliver like the mm -hmm. Hebrew women don't go for CS mm -hmm. you see mothers having prolonged labor yeah. or those that even go for antenatal or children having cord around the neck that should actually go for mm -hmm. C-section mm -hmm. so imagine a child with a cord around the neck going through labor for hours prolonged labor the water breaking up more than 24 hours having infections Absolutely, that child will come down with developmental disability or intellectual disabilities. Mm -hmm. and then we have, even after that, you have children they didn't cry at birth and they won't take them to hospitals, home deliveries. We have neonatal jaundice, the yellowness of the eyes. You see them putting mother's urine inside the oh eyes, see them putting toothpaste inside the eyes, and all sorts of things. And the child will have, there's no way that child will have developmental sure. disabilities and then when the child has infection the cord instead of cleaning the cord the spirit they're using cow dung mm. to clean it and putting toothpaste on top and all sorts of things the child will have infection yes. oh definitely and then meningitis malaria anything that will affect the brain of an immature child before the age of two years most likely will cause developmental disability. Okay. Wow. I've never heard of all these things before oh, it's yes. news to me. Okay. But also we have to be conscious of traumatic brain injury. Yeah. It can yes. happen to anybody at any time. Okay. You know, like she was saying sometimes when the baby injury doesn't cry. On, on the mother or the child. The child. The child. The child. Yes. You know, they pick, mm -hmm. the child, they pick the child up and start Sh shaking. shaking. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. that injures the brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, when they use, um, what is it, like forceps to pull the yes. child out. Sometimes it squeezes the brain. Yes. That also causes some kind of brain damage. Where you play hard sports, you hit your head, or maybe in an accident, you could hit a head against something solid. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, have concussion may actually also damage parts of the brain. Okay. Traumatic brain injury that goes learning disability. Mm -hmm. You know, well, memory defects. The ones that not you 
perfect mom, take mm -hmm. your medication, mm -hmm. nothing, and they just come out. And yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah those especially in autism and neurodevelopment. Yeah. 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 Those are the ones that are about it. Point. Very but they're bad preventable bad. ones. Mm -hmm. There's one um, that is quite common, but we don't really think about it. You know, when a, a child is born, we like to place a child on the tummy. Yes. Yeah, it's not right because a child can regurgitate mm -hmm. after yeah. burping, mm -hmm. can regurgitate animal choke on the smoke and the yes. things, the fluid. It can cause sudden infant death syndrome. You know, our mothers taught us to place it maybe on, on the, the yeah. flat on the on the abdomen. Say that. Yes. <laughs> no, it's, no, but it's wrong. It you is. place on the side, side. or side. lay face oh, up. Uh, because it can lead uh, to asphyxia. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, you talked, uh, I, I, I feel that there's quite a bit of awareness out there um, concerning autism, but ADHD, which you mentioned, I'd like you to speak on that, and also dyslexia, because some people are watching and they don't know which is which. So maybe you want to give us um, some definitions and how to, mm -hmm. uh, if you if you suspect that, how, what symptoms to look out for. <laughs> uh, ADHD means attention deficit hyperactive disorder. It's when a child, usually more than four years, when they are not able to stay in a place and they are not able to pay attention and learn and is severe enough to affect the child's everyday life, cognitive function, affects the academics and it must have been there in more than two different settings. Okay. We say the child has ADHD and we have different kinds. We have the hyperactive kind. The child cannot stay in one place. Even when they are sitting, they are screaming. They, they yeah. cannot take it. Yeah, a lot of people will be like, my, <laughs> yeah. my son does that, my daughter does but, that all the time. But, but it's severe enough to affect the child's okay. daily okay. living. The okay. child will answer questions even before the, the question is being asked. Okay. The child cannot focus. Okay. When it comes to the inattentive type, they will not pay attention. They forget everything. They Good misplace goodness. their pencils. Mm -hmm. They they keep on blanking out in mm -hmm. classrooms. Okay. So that is ADHD. Okay. And then dyslexia? And then dyslexia. In the, sometimes children with ADHD can also have dyslexia. Yeah, right. And both of them are part of neurodevelopmental disorders under specific learning disability. That's the dyslexia. When it comes to dyslexia, a child has problem in recognition, reading, sounding of words. So they can talk, no problem. When it comes to visual learning, they can say everything. But when it comes to that reading and sounding of individual words or even in combination of those words, to read it out, recognize the words and the sounds, that is when a child has dyslexia. Mm -hmm. And it's severe, it's severe enough to also affect the child's reading capacity for age as well. Okay. Is uh, there a part of neurodevelopmental disorder? Okay. Uh, so a child with ADHD... Uh, what kind of therapy? How do you get a, a child with ADHD to, to learn, down. to okay. settle down? Before what do you do? I answer that question, I wanted to add something because okay. um, it's a common thing you see that people think, okay, since my child is not hyperactive, then probably my child doesn't have ADHD. There's also what we call ADD, ADD. attention deficit disorder. Okay. So okay. that's attention, um, you know, they are inattentive without hyperactivity. Okay. So basically, we, it's a common condition, but people don't know that it's common. Okay. Because you find that the child has a short attention span, is not doing very well in school, um, usually absent-minded, daydreaming, but then might not be hyperactive. Okay. So okay. that you see a lot. Okay. And it's not diagnosed often, but it's a major challenge. Okay. Even in our classroom, you see a child that you people call the child Olodo, oh Mumu, he's mm -hmm. not learning. Mm -hmm. But usually it's the inattention. It's like sometimes you find a child who he's saying something and one minute is like he has just forgotten the line of thoughts and that's the example okay. sometimes they are reading a book and the child just loses track he jumps a sentence to the next mm -hmm. it's a very common thing so that's ADD that's why I had to point that out okay. sure. now how do you handle a child who is hyperactive the first thing for classroom to help teachers is make sure the child sits close to you away from the window those are the basic things to do. Then the assessment is key, obviously. You have to assess. And very importantly, the symptoms have to have shown for at least six months. Not just that, okay, one day the child is hyperactive, the next day he's not. For mm -hmm. six months, consistently. And then you can... But what about people or parents that say, I don't give them uh, soft drinks, don't give them sugary drinks. That, is it true yes, that it's, yes. is it true yes. that it goes hand in hand? Yes. Because yes. you're not really sure if they're... Mm -hmm. 
if they're true or they don't want these people to sell their market. No, no, so it really it's there is a connection is. between hyperactivity and yeah. I, yes. I like to add to that because there's also something central integration disorder, mm -hmm. okay. okay, which is prevalent in children with ADHD, mm -hmm. hyperactive disorder. Okay, and in addressing that, we need to find out what are they being too sensitive to. They may be too sensitive to the light. Like the light is beaming right there as if normal to a child who has central integration disorder. That may be like the sun is frying the child. So, of course, the child is not going to sit still. Yeah. Okay? The child could have such visual acuity that the child can actually read every single pore on your hair. And then the light is so bright and the child is supposed to read a book. Of course, the child is not going to pay attention. The child may feel like the pain, pain drops, pain somewhere in the body. It could be allergic reaction to something that we're not aware of that's affecting them. We always need to also assess the guts, the inside. Mm -hmm. Okay, what are they allergic to? That may be causing this overstimulation. Okay. Okay, that they're trying to avoid by running or jumping, you know, or crying. We need to address this. Once we're able to address that and rectify whatever that is, then the ADHD aspect will reduce. Okay. Okay. Some people like to give their children stimulants. I always, um, um, I'm against it, yeah. personally, yeah. because I've been in the classroom, I've had children with ADHD, they were given medications. Okay, they take those medications, they sit, they're very placid, you know, they're obedient, they're quiet, perfect classroom yeah. setting, but the child really wasn't really learning. The child was just there, like yeah. a vegetable practically. But even when the child do participate, they may actually learn something, but once you take away the medication, they forget it, and they go back. So what's the essence of giving them medication? Are you going to give them medication for life? They have side effects. But if you treat the internal aspect, the gut, by taking away some things that the child is you know, sensitive to, then they start having calming effects on them. Then the light is not so glary anymore. You know, then the, the allergic reaction is no longer there. Mm -hmm. So we have to also treat that. There's a percentage of parents that won't even take the children out of the house. They won't bother with educating mm -hmm. the child. What do you have to say? Maybe you as a mother and doctor and yeah, a doctor we'll dance, maybe anybody don't want You have a lot to say about <laughs> that. <laughs> okay, we'll give everyone some time to talk about it. <laughs> okay. Should I start? Yes, please. I have a saying. You know, everyone knows that I say this all the time. I take my children everywhere with me. Since they were little, I don't look at their disability. I look at the joy they bring me. Mm -hmm. And I look at my devotion to them. I'm not devoting my time and energy to somebody else, to an outsider, who has some preconceived idea about you know, disabilities or wants to marginalize my children. I'm a fighter when it comes to my kids, okay? children learn and do stuff and I'll be like my mom. Oh. <laughs> my mom is my day. She made my day. Oh. <laughs> uh, is a funny sister as she talk, talk, talk. So. She's a funny sister as she talk, 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 but that's good. Uh, she, I and uh, uh, Daya. What, I want to take Dio with me to China. And I'm going to China. To Chi do what? To go to school. In China? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> to get a car, to get a good children, a good husband. Oh. <laughs> and he needs a, a good wife and children. <laughs> Okay. So I always tell mothers, your priority is your family. Your children are your number one. You know, yes, your husband, but your children need you more than your husband. So you don't have to think about it and prioritize. Should I listen and be afraid of other people looking at me with my kid? Or do I need to teach my child how to survive when I'm no longer around? Okay. For me, the choice is clear. I have to teach my child 
how to survive, how to fit into the world, because the world belongs to all of us. So I tell them, why are you hiding your children at home? Okay, so people say, okay, oh, you have a child with disability. So what? They are not perfect. They've got their own disabling conditions as well. It may just not be evident. evident. You know, we all have things we're good at. These children have strengths. They have amazing strengths. There's some things they can do that we cannot do. Okay, we just need to explore. So I always say that give them the opportunity, please. Take them out. Let them learn functional life skills. They won't learn that in the house. In the house yeah. They have to go out to get it. Okay, Sylvia? For me, I have to be very honest uh, about my experience, um, brutally so, especially to myself. Um, initially, as a mom, um, I was overprotective of my son. I didn't want to bring my son up because, not because I was ashamed. I didn't just want people to laugh at him when he's having his episodes and all that. So I was being a protective mom until one day I spoke to myself. I'm like, okay, are you going to do this forever? If you don't tell people about him, if you don't explain to people what he's going through, if you're no longer there, how would they react to him? So I, that day I really had a crying episode. I really hmm. cried a lot and I said, no, I have to, I started going everywhere with my son, Great. everywhere. Great. And I tell people, this is how he is. Hmm. And I'm okay with it. Good. And you have to be okay with it. Hmm. And if you're not okay with it, that's your problem. Mm -hmm. My son, I don't look at his disabilities, mm -hmm. I look at his abilities. Mm -hmm. I was sharing with, I'm not going to say I shared with them what happened today. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to say it, but it's all part of mm -hmm. the yeah, process. process yeah. Normally, years back, if that had happened, I would have gone under the chair. But I'm like, well, that's Kanye. So. Yeah. That's what it is. That's him. Yeah. And it's also a teachable yeah. moment to yeah. teach others. To teach yeah. others. Yeah. And um, with that, and people take a cue from you. If you react negative to your child, it's kind of like a ripple effect. They mm -hmm. react because you're reacting. If you say, oh, it's okay. It's okay with me. Yeah, it's okay. They're like, okay. Yeah. yeah. And so when people they learn see through your, yes, your, yes, your story, yes. your eyes, yes. your experience. And that's what I taught my other children. So mm -hmm. they accept him and they, they have made their own friends mm -hmm. to accept my son. And their friends have told their own friends about my son. So it's like a ripple effect. It just Wonderful. goes and goes. Okay. For me, I've, um, I've seen a lot of children, we've assessed <laughs> those of thousands of specialist children, and I have seen children that have been locked up at home up until 20 years, wow. and after some therapy, the parents, because of uh, being ashamed and religious um, issues, they will lock the child back up again. And I've also come to see parents being in denial. They just don't want to believe their child has special needs. Oh, this child is supposed to go to Harvard. Now all my aspirations have come to nothing. Are, are you sure my child has special needs? So they will be in denial for a long time until it dawns on them that this child needs extra help. So when I come in contact with such parents, or with every parent, I make them realize that this child has issues. Because they don't want to believe, oh, my child can talk. Oh, my child knows who I am and looks at me in the eyes and says, okay, call the child. Mm -hmm. And it's so obvious and glaring that the child has needs. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, when you're no longer there, who are you leaving this child mm -hmm. for? Your children, your sisters, your brothers. How will you feel in your grave when you're looking at this child? What will come into your mind? So it's better you start something now because early intervention is very important. So you can do something and harness their abilities. That thing they are good at or help them develop a skill mm -hmm. that will make them acquire independence at life so that even if you get them, a, uh, if, you, if you give them money or make sure their finances are right and someone pays them every month, they can take care of themselves. They can cook and look after themselves without being a big burden on another person. Okay, okay. okay so um, one of the things I tell parents when they meet me first is if I imagine your child was okay and he goes out and has a fight and comes back all bruised up, but it's his fault. Would you fight for him? And they're always, oh, of course, yes. And I say, it's the same scenario. 
you have to fight for your child at this point. So your child, imagine your child is battling with something outside himself. Would you fight for your child or would you watch that child? And usually the response is, oh, they get that into perspective. And I said, so the important thing is you're your f child's first advocate. Mm -hmm. Nobody can speak for your child mm -hmm. or yourself. Okay. So locking him up, first of all, you're, you know, killing his self-confidence. You're telling him, I wish you were not here. You're telling him you're not worth living. So what are you giving that child? What future are you giving that child? Which is very important. His self-esteem, his self -confidence. Denial is a big issue. Being a parent, which is a person, being a parent is difficult. It's hard work. Special or not, it's hard work. And, okay, so. Mm, as a parent, I, I think a lot of parents, they struggle with it as well. Man, I know you understand what uh, I mean. The first thing is, acceptance mm -hmm. just tell yourself that there is a problem here mm -hmm. with me when i noticed those things that he wasn't the master that he wasn't mm -hmm. meeting up to i'll go i'll read about everything you know when you google autism will pop up mm -hmm. and i'll say holy ghost fire is not my portion mm -hmm. you know i i didn't want to accept it i'm like no i'm going to pray it away i'm going to believe it away but it got to a point when a friend of mine brought the daughter to my house and the same we had the baby at the same time I, I told myself wake up sometimes i mean it's good to have a, a label to know exactly what it is you're dealing with but other people using those labels and some parents would prefer yes i know my son has a challenge but don't label him i don't know what your thoughts are on that okay i believe in if you label him you you focusing on the disability i would think let's focus on the child's ability okay the label it's for diagnosis purpose just to know okay this is the problem and then you start tackling the problem but don't dwell on that label and don't allow other people to dwell on that label start talking about his or her ability oh if they can swim very well oh my daughter is the best if they can Paint my daughter is the best if they can ride a bike. Focus on what they can do and what, and not on what they cannot do. And those things they cannot do, you start doing therapy. <coughs> to be, they might not be on par with their legs, but just for them to function in the society. And is it easy to find a therapist? People like you. I mean, there are so many um, disorders on the spectrum: Asperger's, ADHD, AD. I mean, I'm, I'm learning a few even today. Uh, those with Down syndrome, those with cerebral palsy. Are there enough therapists to cater to the children that need this support and help? Well, they're not enough. Anywhere in the world, they're not enough. Mm -hmm. Talkless of Nigeria. But the good thing that we have going for us in Nigeria is the willingness of those who have centers, the specialists we have, to train others. Mm -hmm. We support each other. This is a network you're looking at right here. I met her today, but she said we've actually met. I'm mm -hmm. always with her when she has events, training, and she's with me supporting. And I'm sure I've seen you at OLG. So we have that network, and there's, there are other providers in Abuja here that we support each other. We train others. But people who really need to want to be trained. Okay. That's another thing. I found the challenge with um, situations where teachers feel like they don't have enough time during the day, and now we're asking them to come for training after work hours. You cannot pull them out while students are in school. So that becomes a challenge. Okay. So you now want to pull them out when they're on vacation. Some are a bit resistant to that. But then you do find some who have the passion that they actually really want to be educators. You know, they really want to impact lives and they do attend the training. But what I like the best is all this autism awareness, Down syndrome awareness, we seize the opportunity to educate, you know, to stress the importance of training. Even at private schools, okay. public schools, they need to train and be retrained. Even us, we're constantly getting retrained. Mm -hmm. You know, technology is changing, mm -hmm. science is discovering new things, new disabilities have been discovered every day. So you need to be abreast and be willing to keep educating yourself. And they have other places, but you only find clusters in big cities like Abuja, Lagos, 
maybe Port Harcourt, you, you know, just clusters in different cities. But there's a need for training, and it has to be done in collaboration with government, with the Ministry of Education. Also, the teacher training process they go through to become teachers. Mm -hmm. Okay, they have to make sure they're properly bringing up the teachers in the tertiary institutions, teach them the correct methodologies and strategies for teaching. And we also have to localize it to our own local content, mm -hmm. not just take somebody else's curriculum. We need to develop curriculum that has our own frame of reference that we can all connect with, make connections with. Okay, okay. okay. adding to what she said, interestingly, there are a couple of schools in Nigeria that train you know, special educators, occupational therapy, but the major challenge is you find that their skill set is not suited for the field work. Okay. It's first of all outdated, they don't know what is happening, you know, and they can't even apply the reality on ground. For special education, they are trained on visually impaired, mostly physical disabilities, okay. but they are not trained on neurodevelopmental challenges, so that is a major issue on its own. So when they come out, there's that big dissonance between what they've learned and what mm -hmm. is the reality on ground. Okay. And of course, the social norms, the societal um, mindset. You see some people who see children with seizure disorder, and their special educators, and the reaction is, Jesus, Jesus, you know that mm -hmm. reaction, and you're yeah, special, you should do these things. You know, yeah. And so that's the major challenge. So, okay. But like she said, we keep training, we keep creating environments to pass the message, advocate for it. You know, talk to people, are you interested? Come. There are lots of free training, at least I know with um, OLG, they often have free trainings, open doors, okay. and a couple of ones I've done. For most schools I meet or, or I go to with parents, one of the things I say first is, I'm willing to offer a free training to the teacher because you need to know how to work with this child. You know, so okay. that's... that's um, we're, we're running out of time, but I, I will throw my last question to Sylvia and Dr. Doris. Um, do you have any words for school management proprietresses out there that um, don't have facilities for special needs children? What can they do? Because they need to have that. I, I believe that it's very important. Okay, for teachers, and not just for teachers, for every school in this world, they should be able to have a level of competence in taking care of special needs children because they are children, yeah. first and foremost, before they have special needs. Mm -hmm. So nothing stops them from training their teachers to even identify and recognize a special needs child mm -hmm. and then accept organizations that are willing to help the child in their regular school. We've had instances of, of schools saying, no, we don't take special needs child. No matter how good yeah. they have come a come to them yeah. or oh, we don't want shadows or anyone to help this child we can't do it when they cannot do anything so they should train themselves and there are people willing to train them it's not that expensive really to get the basic training to take care of special needs child but when it comes to the specialized ones they can send one or two people to go and learn about it or even collaborate with centers that can help special needs children there mm -hmm. and we don't have enough we have people traveling from Abba to Potakot just to get assessment done mm -hmm. traveling from Enugu to Abuja just to get their assessment and that's not right. Mm. So we need, everybody needs to be able to do something about it in their regular school and even in hospital settings as well. Okay. okay. For me, I think every school owner should teach their teachers, their caregivers, just the basic skills of just being able to tell if a child has a, an issue or not because it goes a long way. And being Telling the teachers also not to raise any red flags and tell the parents. They shouldn't say, oh, I can't tell the parents. Why should I tell the parents that their child has a problem or not? Yeah. They should pick up the courage and tell the parents because a lot of parents, especially those that are in denial, they need, need somebody to tell them to say, oh, there's an issue. And most times, if it's coming from the teacher, they listen because the child is with the teacher most of the mm -hmm. day. So that's my take home for the my thought for the uh, for people that own schools. Okay. And right. They're also online. Education is global now. Okay. They can just go online. You know, watch some webinar, take some training. All so a lot of them are free. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, doctor, maybe you'll just uh, do a quick summary for us for people out there that are watching and are waiting to take or this 
program has helped them to decide to take that next step when it okay. comes to their child. All right. For those of you out there who are parents like we are, with children with special needs, or you know somebody who does, please tell them early intervention is really paramount. It's the most critical thing, the most important decision they can make. Okay. So let them have be assessed appropriately by a trained person, not just anyone. A lot of people call themselves therapists now. So let them see a clinical psychologist. Let them talk to their pediatricians, developmental specialists right away. Make sure the children are in school. Educate your children. It's not just academics. It's also about life skills. You need to bring your children out. The closet, the wardrobe, the bedroom is not doing them any good. If anything, it's worsening situations for you as a parent. So in order to make it easier for you, especially when you get older, you must start taking them out now and start teaching them what's basic. Please, please, and please I beg you, don't ever be ashamed of your children. Mine are my joy. They give me such unconditional love. I will not trade them for anything. It has gotten so much easier over the years. So there's light at the end of the, of the tunnel. And they have strengths, trust me. You just need to get it out. Thank you to all our special guests for coming in today and talking about special needs education and special needs in general in Nigeria. Our social media handles are available on the screen. If you have a question or a comment for any one of our guests today, we would love to hear from you. We can always relay it um, to them. It's been Mike in the conversation room with all the ladies in-house. Thank you so much and see you again soon. Goodbye.